Amen. Such a privilege to be here. I actually want to start the service off a little different. I asked Pastor Brandon to stay uh, on the keys. I just felt God's spirit in this house during worship. And I felt as we were declaring, who are you, Great Mountain? I think a lot of us started to think about our troubles. I think there's people in this room, you began to think about uh, who's your enemy? What's your adversary? Is it your job? Is it your boss? Is it uh, your husband or your wife? Hello. You started to think, what was the mountain in your life? And I really feel that the spirit of the Lord is saying, you are the mountain in your own life. You're the one that's blocking you from getting to the promised land. You're the obstacle in your own face, in your own plan, in your own path. And that's why you're not experiencing the breakthrough that we just sang about. And so before we do anything, I want us to pray. I want us to pray that God, if it's me, get me out the way. Get my own priorities, get my own past, get my own feelings or my attitude. Get it out of the way. Because breakthrough is in this house. Breakthrough is in this place. I don't know your story, but I know in one moment, God can come in and he can rewrite that story. God can come in and he can rewrite that attitude. He can rewrite that disposition. I just believe God that much that he can remove that mountain. So if that's you, maybe you just place your hand on your heart. I just want to pray because I don't want anybody to not be able to receive the word of the Lord because you're in your own way. So Father, right now, God, we surrender ourselves to you. God, we humble ourselves. We surrender our own pride. God, our own uh, anxiety or depression. God, whatever it is that's been on our heart that's been weighing us down. God, we repent and we ask for forgiveness right now, Lord, that we've been trusting in ourselves more than we've been trusting in you. God, that we've been trying to operate in our own strength, Lord. God, forgive us, Father, for thinking we had it figured out. God, there's no past hurt or past pain that is greater than your love and your kindness, your mercy and your forgiveness. So right now, Lord, pour it out in abundance. Right now, God, remove the mountain. Right now, God, shrink it, God. Cast it into the sea, Lord. We want to receive from you, Lord. We're believing for great things, Lord Jesus. Who are you, great mountain? Who am I, Lord? to get in the way of what you want to do in my life. So Lord, we lay it down to you right now. We surrender, we submit, we humble ourselves, and we bow down to you, God. Come on, I just feel there's breakthrough in this place. More than hearing a message from me, you need to hear a message from the Lord. More than hearing what man has to say, we need to hear what God wants to say to that situation, what God wants to say to you right now. And for some of us, the only voice we hear from God is condemnation. That is not from God's spirit. He wants to encourage you. He wants you to experience his compassion and his love for you that's overflowing. The apostle Paul says, who am I? I can't even judge myself. Romans 8 teaches us that there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's time to cast the mountain into the sea. So Lord, we yield to you in this place, Jesus. Have your way, Lord, in and through our lives. We're merely empty vessels, God, and we want to be used by you, Lord. So we thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for your presence. God, would you prepare our hearts to receive from you, Lord? Would you, would you be glorified, God, today? Would the church be edified, Lord? And I pray that every demon in hell, Lord, would be terrified because we got revelation, God, that you are the victorious one. So we thank you, Jesus. We trust you to do it today in our lives, and it's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God is good. Well, it is such a joy and a privilege uh, to be here, truly. Uh, This is home for me. This is my house. Uh, Even though you might not know me, this is my house. There you go. I live here. Uh, I was, uh, as as Pastor Jesse said, this is the first place I ever got to see ministry done, be a part of ministry. Matter of fact, I was thinking about the very first encounter I ever had with anybody from Real Life Church. Uh, I was in Baja, Mexico. Come on, James Lund. And I remember, I don't know if Mason's here, but I remember uh, we were, uh, we had like lunch. We had just got there. I got on a bus. I didn't know anybody. I got on this van. They drove me down to Mexico. I don't know what I was thinking. And um, I remember we ate and I, I went upstairs and talked to the only person I knew. And I remember telling Mason, I said, these are like real Christians. 
Like these are, this is it. This is the real deal. So this is my home. I love you guys. Uh, as Pastor Jesse said, um, when I left here uh, three years ago, there's actually a photo of just me and my wife. Uh, this is what uh, I think we got it there. Boom. There is my wife and I, Chelsea. Uh, she is incredible. One of the reasons why I love this place is because me and her got married right here in this very house. Somebody say amen. But not only did we get to Chicago, uh, we weren't bored, but we had two kids. And uh, here are our two children. Uh, the first one, come on, man, my son, both of them are just incredible. The oldest one is Apollos. He is, uh, he's going to be trouble. Just watch out. Um, and then uh, our, our newest son, Apollos is two years old. Uh, our second son, Ananias James, he is uh, two months old. And my wife and all of us were here. Um, and we're just so privileged. We love this church. We love your pastors, Pastor Dean and Amy. Man, they are such a blessing. Can we honor them real quick? I know they're not here. They are truly a blessing. I remember my first conversation with Pastor Dean. It just, he's such a servant. He's such a servant. He was looking all the different ways he could serve me. And just, they're so generous. Uh, and so Pastor Dean and Amy, we just love you. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go to Ephesians chapter four and say amen when you get there. Because I don't want to read the Bible alone. Ephesians chapter 4, right now you as a church are in this series called Gifted. And I want to just tell you, Real Life Church, this is a message, this is a series that I believe is so true for this house. You are gifted. This is a gifted house. There are gifted people in this house, and I believe God is taking you to new levels in that gift to see an expansion like you have never believed before. And so today I get the privilege to talk about God's equipping grace. We know that in the Bible we get these graces that God gives us, which are the gifts. Uh, Pastor Dean has already touched on it on Romans last week, and, and the next week you guys are going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But today, today I want to talk about the gifts that Christ himself gave in Ephesians 4. Now, in the church world, we kind of call these the five-fold ministry. It's kind of the pillars or the pinnacle of ministry that would take place. And often in church, there's a little debate about them. Of, is there still uh, uh, apostles today or prophets today and all these things? I'm not here to talk about that. I want us to think about these five-fold gifts, these five areas as offices, as a department in the kingdom of God, as a department in the body of Christ. There's these five pillars that you and I have been called and graced with the gift to operate in. And so as we go to Ephesians 4, uh, I just want us to have our hearts and minds open that God wants to equip us. God wants to equip you and I with the grace that is said here. Apostle Paul is writing this letter, not just to the church in Ephesians, but he knew that this letter was going to be read aloud uh, to the whole providence of churches that were in this area at the time. And so I didn't hear any amens. Ephesians chapter 4, are we there? Amen. amen. Okay, here we go. Chap uh, starting in verse 7 uh, through 16, it says this, But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean? Except that, also he, uh, that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is, very, uh, is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavenly ones in order to fill the whole universe. Essentially what Paul is saying is, Jesus has all the right and authority to give us these gifts. He's quoting Psalm 68, and he's saying Jesus has a right to di distribute these gifts. So then in verse 11, it says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all, everyone say all, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure and the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the, waves, uh, uh, by the waves blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning craftiness of people and their deceitful schemings. Instead, speaking truth and love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, we pray in these next few moments that we have together, Lord, that you would show yourself to be true and faithful, that you would teach us, Lord. So open our ears, open our hearts, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
So God's gift for us in these five offices is that he wants us to become equipped. The first thing we need to understand if you're taking notes is Christ has graced us with the ability to be equipped, but also to equip others. He has graced you and I to be equipped. What does that mean for us? That means he's given us the ability to learn and grow. If the way you live as a Christian is the same as it was when I left here three years ago, there's a problem. We are called to be equipped. This is a beautiful thing because sometimes when it comes to the things of God or to the scripture, we're like, Lord, I don't know where to start. They told me to start in John. I started reading John. Now what? And we feel like, what do I do? How do I grow? How do I become? If you would allow me today, I'm going to use a lot of personal references as this house has been an entire journey for me on this this process, the equipping process and how it's taken place. When I got here, Jesse was being nice, but like I say, I was, I, I was a heathen. I was horrible. And she got inherited this young 20-year-old who didn't know anything, who was in Bible college, and the only thing I knew about the Bible was Moses and the Red Sea. And so I have been on this journey of being equipped, and that's why I believe you're in the right house, because this house has the anointing on it to develop people. You don't have to stay the same. Christ has graced you, and he's graced your leaders. This is what I love about Pastor Dean and Amy. Everything they hold is with an open hand. Every person, everyone's gift, they never see it as, oh, we gotta hold them in. Oh, we gotta control them. No, they wanna foster that gift and they wanna release people. I have never been so blessed by Pastor Dean and Amy's generosity towards me and Chelsea when we went to Chicago. Man, he, I mean, I wasn't even on staff and he was treating me like I was. Just so generous with this equipping process. God has graced you with the ability to be equipped. Some of you think that the effectiveness, the way you serve in church, the way you operate in your gifts is simply, well, you know, I stack the chairs or I fill up the communion cups. Well, that's great. Like, we want that. We need that. But I'm telling you, there's more. There's more. You you have been called to be an equipper. You've been called to be equipped by him, and he uses these five offices to do that for us. To equip is simply to supply the necessary items needed to do a work. It's to supply the necessary items. In fact, the word Paul is using here in equipping is saying to train. We like training. We're like, come on, train me. But also to discipline. Ooh, I don't want to, I want to grow God, but I don't want to be disciplined. Ain't nobody going to say amen to that. (laughs) So he wants to equip us. He wants to see us. And so we have these five gifts. So we have the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. The apostles' job That office, really what it is, is is those who have the sent ones, the ones who have been commissioned with the authority that the sender is sending them on. For two reasons, to proclaim the work that the sender is doing, Christ, but also to establish the church. We need those who operate in that apostolic office because it brings up the establishment, the growing, the expansion of the things of God. I was recently with a pastor, uh, uh, Pastor Dominic. Yo, he's out in Indonesia. This dude is in everything. Oh, my goodness. And I remember he was talking to some of our staff, and we asked him, how many times do you preach? He's a senior pastor of the church. How many times do you preach? Four times a year. What? Four times a year? I was like, wait, say that again. Go ahead. He's like, yeah, he operates in his apostolic office. He's like, I'm here to establish the church and see it grow. So as a senior pastor, he doesn't speak every week. As a senior pastor, he's over the interns developing, equipping, teaching young people who don't understand yet, or hey, that's, that, that's actually not biblical, let's, let's adjust this way, or here's a good way to exegete the text, or here's a good way to serve others. And I was blown away at this, because so often in church, we think that whoever your senior pastor is needs to have all five offices, and we pigeonhole them and think, well, they need to be apostolic, they need to be prophetic, they need to be evangelistic, and we don't stop and say, wait a minute, what is the, God, what is the grace God is equipping me with? When we talk about these five gifts, please do me a favor. Don't check out thinking that's not for you. Don't check out and think, oh, that's only for the pastors. That's only for the people on staff. No, this is for everybody. Christ's apportioned is for all of us. If you're a New Testament believer, he's called you to this equipping process. But not only so that you can be equipped and you can be flashy and you know how to pray and you can pray all loud and you can shout. That's not why. It's so you can equip other people. See, these five-fold gifts, and I'm going to get into them more, these five-fold gifts are simply to equip those to go and then do the work. It's not the job of, and I can say this because I'm about to leave at the, at the end of this, it's not the job for your pastors on staff to do all the work in this house. 
It's not Pastor Dean's job to be the only teacher in this house. It is all of us, we've all been commissioned to be equipped and to equip others. So the apostles were commissioned, they were sent out, they walked with this authority as the one who sent them. And then we have the prophets. These are the messengers of God. These are people who can give the rhema word. That spirit. What is the Holy Spirit saying in a moment, in a season? Man, you need these people around you who can speak prophetically into things. Pastor Jesse and I had a joke. When I first got here, she'd been saved a lot longer than me. Uh, it's because there's a little age difference. We won't get into that. Um, it was like every Sunday, every time I came into this church, someone had a prophetic word for me. It was a joke. Like, we would joke about it, like, oh, my gosh, every, you got another word. Wow, okay, cool. And she's had, like, you know, just a few. And so she would get upset, like, why do you get all the words? And I'm like, well, it's because God's trying to really speak to me. He got he to clean up a lot. But you need prophetic people in your life, people who are going to give you that now word, that, that thing, that encouragement, that challenge that you need in the season right now and what you're going through. And that's the office of the prophets. Then we have the evangelists. And you know someone who has this gift when you go out to eat with them. They're the person that you can't just sit down and enjoy your food because they got to get the whole restaurant saved. They're the person that has to tell your waiter and then get the busser and then get the host and they got to tell all of them about what your church is doing. You got to edify conference. You got to know about this. You gotta, and sometimes you just want to eat. But the evangelists can't control themselves. They're the heralds of the gospel. They have to tell the good news everywhere. They're the person that when they walk in and, and you know, you casually say, hey, how are you? And some like, yeah, I'm doing okay. They're, oh, just Okay. And they're like evangelism light go off. And they just, okay, well, let me tell you, we're going to do this, this, and this, and this is what you need to do. That's the evangelist's office. Some of you naturally have it. You're naturally gifted in it. It just comes out of you. So we need those people who are going to just go out into the marketplace. That's what I love, the vision for Love Natomas. Go and rub shoulders with the community. That's that evangelistic office or arm in this church. The two we're most familiar with is the pastors and teachers. The pastors are simply the leadership for the church. They're supposed to provide leadership, but also soul care. They're there to want to wanna walk through the messes, walk through the pain, walk through the hard things that the flock are going through. I'll never forget, in Bible college, I had a professor tell me as we were studying pastoral ministry, and like I said, pastors have to love people. And I had a professor tell me, hey, James, uh, you're, you're going to school to become a pastor. You don't love people. And I thought about it. I was like, man, he's kind of right. Like, ooh, man. And so what I had to do was I had to be confronted with, man, I don't naturally just love people. And so I had to say, God, help me to see people the way you see them and not the way I see them. Help me to have compassion. Help me to grow in humility. Help me to know that I don't understand their story. Help me to know that just because I would see something this way doesn't mean that's the way they're experiencing it. And so I had to pray, God, help me to love people. Pastors love people. They love them despite whatever they're going through. And sheep do bite, and they still love the sheep after they bite. The pastors. Then we have the teachers, those who expound on the truth of Scripture, those who can take what is complex or what can be hard to understand in Scripture, and they can break it down so it's easily digestible. They can teach us how to accurately interpret the word and not just, you know, quote verses randomly in part and kind of mix two together so it sounds real good and post it on Instagram. No, the teachers are there to help us to really understand what is the word of God, how we can understand it. Now, you might be in this place and feel like I don't fit in any of those categories. But I would say you just need a little bit more training. You just need a little bit more equipping. You might just need a little bit more discipline, but God has it for you. You know, I've been taught that there's an order to this, and it's simply learn, live, and give. Learn, live, and give. Nobody wants to receive from somebody something they ain't ever learned before. You don't go to the doctor's office, and they just let you, you know, just so you know, I didn't graduate medical school. <laughs> I'm going to operate on your heart tomorrow, but I got an AA from the local community college. Sac City gave me an AA in medicine, so I, I should be good. Nah, you ain't touching me. Nobody wants to receive from something, some, th something from someone if they haven't learned it. And so maybe in your equipping process, you just need to learn a little bit. That's Okay. Maybe you just need to grow in that a little bit. Maybe you need to get under one of your pastors or leaders here and say, hey, Pastor Damien, how do you go from there was no Dalte to now you're saying, man, I want to have this ministry that's going to speak to a generation about purity. That's that learning process. And when we learn it, now we can live it. Now we can walk that thing out because don't give me nothing that you ain't living out. Don't come and tell me to read my Bible and you ain't ever cracked yours open. 
Don't tell me that's how you're supposed to uh, love on people when you ain't li- loving on people. So we got to walk this thing out, right? We got to live it. After we live, now we can give it to somebody. Hey, hey, here's, the, here's how this works. I'll never forget, uh, Dennis Palmer's here, but I'll never forget when Dennis had uh, Zoe, their first child, I was still young and kind of dumb. And so he told me, he said, hey, you don't know what tired is until you've had a kid. And I was like, man, don't tell me I don't know what tired is. I could grind. I could stay up all night. I know what tired is. Then I had a kid. And so he was giving me something that he learned and that he lived, and, and I couldn't receive it because I didn't learn it or live it yet. And so we need to understand there's an order. It's simply I do, we do, you do. Some of us, God is trying to activate your gifts, but you need to get in the seat of learning, of watching someone do it, getting close, not watching from a distance, not sitting in the back row. Praise God for the back row. Y'all, we love you. Not sitting in the back row and thinking, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it. No, get close to him. I do, you do, or I do, we do, you do. And then you start to practice, you start to work it out. You know, there's nothing more humbling uh, as, as someone who communicates than to get feedback on what you're communicating. Yeah. Yeah. I literally just did this with Pastor Jesse after the first service. You know how humbling it is to sit down? Okay, okay. So tell me what I did wrong. Well, you know, that sounded a little confused. Oh, what? I practiced for this. I've heard, well, actually, when you said that, it was fumbled. Or my wife walked in. She's like, I watched first service. You fumbled your words a lot. Oh, come on, wife. Why you got to do me like that? See, sometimes we don't, we don't like that. We don't like that, that feedback. But that's what happens when you get in this equipping process. You get feedback. We need feedback. God has graced you with this gift, but he's also graced you with the ability to equip others, to become continually equipped. And let me tell you, don't just stop in one season. Maybe you've, you've been serving for a while. Maybe you've gotten to a certain place and you're like, well, I, I've, I've reached it. No, you haven't. There's always more. There's always more people to equip. You grow, you mature, you do, and now you start to raise up even more people to do. It's just the order for it. It's the reason why Christ gave us this. Look, ministry, serving God, is not about what you do. It's about what you can reproduce. Ministry is not about your talent. It's not about what you can do. It's what can you reproduce. Can you get somebody else to the place that they never thought they could get? Can you see into somebody's life and say, man, there's gifting, there's calling, there's anointing. God has chosen you. You are part of the royal priesthood, a holy nation. And so we want to say, hey, hey, can I reproduce in somebody else? Because that's what I received in this house. I didn't walk in knowing what I was doing. No, leaders, volunteers. I, see, I never forget... Stephen McBride was just my altar cry cry partner. I would come, Stephen would be at the front, and I would just come to him and just hug him and start weeping. I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. I just would weep. I just would cry. There was somebody that was going through this journey with me. So it's not about what you can do. Can you reproduce? I'm preaching out of someone else's Bible today. This isn't my Bible. This is Apollos' Bible, my son. Because I don't want to tell my son how to worship God. I don't want to tell him that I love the word of God. I want to show him. I want, when I give this to him, when he's old enough to understand it, and he goes to Ephesians 4, and he's going to see what I underlined, and he's going to see what I wrote, and he's going to see the questions that I had. He is going to see, there's going to be an impartation into his life about how I worship God, about how I felt like the Bible. It's not about what you can do. My measure for serving God is no longer about me, but can I produce that in my children? Man, when I left, Clara Armstrong was like, Clara Armstrong. And now she's back there running pro presenter. What? That is the fruit of Pastor Jesse and Adam saying, we're going to raise our kids in a certain way. That's fruit. That's reproducing. That's ministry. That's gifting. That's calling. That's equipping. It's what it looks like. And so God has graced you with this ability. Now, now here's the hard part. When it comes to equipping, the natural thing that's going to happen is one question. This is the question you have to ask. Who is the person or who are the people that God is calling me to? Who is that person? If you can't name that person, real quick, if you can't name that group of people, there's probably a problem in the equipping process. Who is it God is calling you to? 
Why is he equipping you for something? We want to be equipped. We want the gifts. Man, Lord, I want that prophetic gift. I want to be able to pray for people and get a vision and to speak to something. But we don't want to have nobody in our life that's, that we're equipping. Who is that person? You should be able to write that down. And then once they get to that place and they're released, you should get a new person. I'll never forget when I was in Nepal with Ron Kawa. Me and Ron come from different backgrounds, different generations, different ways of thinking. But we would walk... And he was walking in life with me as we're walking physically. And he would say things and I would disagree with it. And then I would say things and he would look at me like, you are so dumb. And we just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But in the middle of that, I was listening. In the middle of that, I was hearing and he was depositing in my life, though he knows it or not. You need to have people around you. Gifting is not just for us. It doesn't happen in a closet. But you don't go home and pray in the dark. And then all of a sudden you come out and you speaking in tongues and you got all this understanding and you got this apostolic minute. It's not how it works. We need to have people around us. Who is that person? Who are those people group? I love Pastor Isaiah because you cannot talk to him and not hear his passion and his desire and his zeal for the youth. It comes out of him. Come on. We can praise God for that. It comes out of him. Every conversation you have with him, it is very clear who God has called and equipped him and is using him for. It's for the youth. It's for that generation. Can other people tell who you're called and equipped for? We have to ask ourselves that question. So there's this purpose for these gifts, right? Christ gave them to us so that we can see the fullness and knowledge and understanding of who he is. We can increase in faith, but it also says so that the body of Christ can become mature. Yep, I thought I was going to be quiet when I talked about maturity. (laughs) He's calling us to be mature, When we are equipped, when we're growing, when you're learning and operating in your gift, there's naturally a maturity process. And maturity, it makes makes room for more. It's not a bad thing. It's not a, a, I don't want to have to become mature. Because maturity comes through friction. It comes through adversity. It comes through hardship. It isn't easy. That's why it's maturity and most people are immature. That's why the Apostle Paul says you will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by which way the wind blows or which way the waves are taking you. You were made and called to be anchored to something. You were equipped with the grace that is going to lead to maturity in your life. See, it takes maturity to serve God, not talent. It takes maturity to serve God, not talent. Because look, you might be able to be gifted enough, whimsical enough, You might be able to convince enough people and you will get up here and you will get exposed because your maturity cannot keep you to that place. It's about maturity, not about talent. Some of you are like, I'll never be called. I I definitely don't have that teaching gift. Well, no, 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 hold on. You might because this isn't, again, a message about you need to quit your job and you need to start working at real life church and be on the pastoral. That's not what I'm talking about. This isn't for pastors. This isn't just for full-time ministry. This is for you and I, every single person. Every single one of us, whether you work on a construction site, you work in a classroom, we have been called through these gifts to become mature, to become more humble servants. Because the more humble we are, the lower we go, the more God can use us. So ask ourselves this, is there something in my life, is there change that I'm resisting? Because that very change, that, that maturity thing that God is trying to do in your life might be coming through someone you don't want to receive. Are you resisting maturity because the person doesn't look like what you want them to look like to speak into your life? How can we be used by God? How can we be equipped by God and his people if we won't allow ourselves to go low? If we won't allow ourselves to be raised up, to go through some maturity, to go through some hardship? We have to be willing to be equipped by anybody, not just Pastor Dean. So if your brother or sister comes and you say, hey, can you help me do this thing? Say yes. Sometimes it's easy. Oh, the pastor asked me to do it. I'm going to do it. Oh, okay. Okay, Pastor Damien said, let me, let me sign up for this ministry. I'm going to get in a community group. But no, it could be anybody. That's what maturity is. Oftentimes, we're rejecting the maturity of the Lord that's going to equip us for the next thing all because we don't like who it's coming from. But if you cannot be equipped by God or his people, how can you be used to serve God and his people? Because God works to his people. I'll never forget, man, it's crazy to me. I'll never forget when I was in Bible college, 
I had this thing where I was like, man, if I'm honest, transparent, real life church, I'm like, Lord, you gave me all these old white dudes supporting my life. Like, I need some context. Like, let me get a little flavor, Lord. Hello. I'm just like, man, I don't know if it's going to work, God. I mean, I'm talking old too. So like we different paradigms, right? And can I tell you, I'm going to lunch with one of them on Wednesday. I still talk to them because I was in my mind, I was thinking I can't receive what I need from that guy because he won't understand or he won't get it. But lo and behold, the Lord would use an old white man and Jim Crane and to be an amazing mentor and pillar in my life. To speak life into me. So it might not come from the person that you want it to come from, but it's coming from God. Amen. That's what maturity is. Maturity is the ability to still serve, praise God, to still serve even when you might not want to. See, look, a lack of maturity is dangerous because it leads to these three things. The first one is instability. When you lack maturity in your life, your life is unstable. This is why we see people come in, they're on fire for God, they, they'll praise and shout, and then... And, Three weeks to a month, you're like, I ain't seen so-and-so anymore. Whatever happened to them? Then they come back in, and they're on fire for Jesus again, and whoo, where'd they go? Instability, hot and cold, hot and cold, up and down. It's this crazy roller coaster ride. Immaturity will lead you to instability in all areas of your life. If you're immature with your finances, you won't be unstable in your finances. If you're immature in your relationships, your relationships are going to be a mess. Any area... Lack of maturity leads to instability, but it also leads to susceptibility. You become susceptible to the things of the enemy. The Apostle Paul says you can no longer be an infant because if you are, you might get caught up in the waves of teaching of some whimsical person. You might, get, you might fall to whatever tactics the enemy might have. You become susceptible to sickness, susceptible to a mutation in your heart when you lack maturity. It's not... Well, should I mature more to be used by God? No, it's we have to become more mature. We need more mature Christians in America. Natomas, man, Natomas, I'm shocked. I drove back from the airport and I never seen, I was like, what happened to all the, the fields? There's just houses everywhere. So there's a lot of people moving here. How amazing would it be that there's a mature, on fire, Holy Ghost filled, set apart church that is operating in all five offices to receive them as they come here. The last thing immaturity leads to is it leads to hostility. An immature person is hostile. They're always going from, this is my enemy, I'm being attacked, to this is my enemy, I'm being attacked, to this is my enemy, I'm being attacked. Hostility towards people, towards their family, towards their friends. We know those people who are just hostile. You're like, oh my goodness, just chill. We're ordering pizza. Why you got to be a big deal? Hostility is a warning sign of immaturity in your life. Immaturity is not a one-time lesson, it's a lifestyle. You know, I talked about, and I'm gonna share even more of some of the stories in my life of growing and maturing here. I was at real life, I don't know, seven years, maybe six years the first time, and we came back, and the second time we had come back, I wasn't on staff. Um, the Lord really had me in this weird spot, and I'll never forget, God just told me, just serve Pastor Dean's vision, and that's it. And so I said, okay, whatever you want me to do, Pastor Dean, I'll do. So he said, you know what? I want you to help out with Love, Love Natomas. Okay, great. I'm going to do Love Natomas. Meanwhile, I'm not on staff. I'm not operating in what I feel, God, you've called me, you've gifted me in these offices, but I'm not necessarily doing it in the way I think. He said, hey, I need you to lead the prayer team, the altar team. Okay, great. I'm going to lead the altar team. But all the while... I took over a business and I was cleaning windows and gutters. And I'll never forget this one day. There was one day in particular as I was, it was dumping out rain. I was on a two-story house roof, pouring rain. The roof had algae all on it. It was just a mess. I'm like risking my life. And I'm laying here. And if you know anything about gutters, they're disgusting. They got bird poop, mud, dirt, stuff that I don't even know what that was. And, you know, I got, like, gloves on, but then your gloves rip, and it's just all in your hands, and you're like, okay, I got to get this done. So here I am. I'm laying on this roof, leaning over the edge, risking my life to scoop up garbage, to scoop up junk. And I'm saying, Lord, what did I do? Why am I being benched? I'll never forget. I was so angry at God. 
Lord, you've called me to be a pastor. Lord, you've called me to preach. God, you've called me to serve your people in this capacity. And I'm cleaning a gutter in the rain, risking my life. And so here I am just shoveling it out, complaining, shoveling it out, angry, shoveling it out, confused. And in such a whisper, the Holy Spirit reminded me, if you can't serve me cleaning a gutter, you will never worship me on a stage again. See, my hands went from being a dirty mess to then coming here and laying holy hands on others. See, we get it twisted sometimes. And we think the only way we can be gifted, the only way we can be called is if we're up here. No, it's for everyday life. You business owners, you employees, you teachers. And let me say this, stay at home moms. You can operate in this gifting and you can raise your kids in your home. Do not negate yourself. Do not think, oh, you don't have the ability to do that. No, 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 no. Maturity is going to bring you to that place. Maturity is going to take you there. Don't be like me upset and angry cleaning out a gutter learn the lesson quick that you can still do the work of God you can still operate in one of these five gifts and you can do it with whatever job God has gifted you even if you're in transition right now in your job amen maturity is a lifestyle but it makes room for more because when we grow in that and I never knew this at the time but right after that moment of being on that roof and really learning that lesson, did I get a call from Chicago Tabernacle to go out there? God was waiting for me to learn it. Actually, in fact, real life, we were on a fast right then, I think at that time. And I got a call. He's actually in this room. I got a call from a friend of mine from chi And he said, hey, can you want to come out? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> I want to get off this roof. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> I had to learn the lesson, but yes, sir, I'll get off that roof. Come on. But none of that would have been possible if it weren't for the maturity process of God killing something inside of me. Your maturity process isn't going to look like mine because you're wired different. Your personality is different. Your story is different. But maturity makes room for more. I'll never forget the lesson I learned in that of knowing what it felt as a volunteer to work all day and to hurry up and try to get to church on a Wednesday night and then serve. Man, I was exhausted. But I learned a new appreciation that helps me pastor people today. It's a grind trying to fight traffic and trying to get to church and then serve in kids' ministry. It's a grind. But God can help us as his maturity in us makes room for more and for our giftings. Lastly, you need to understand this and the band can come, is that your gifting is a catalyst for connection. The Apostle Paul says, he says this phrase that stood out to me, and those of you who know me, you're about to laugh in a second. But he says, as we mature in the faith, that we as the body of Christ should become like supporting ligaments. Now, if you know me, I have a nickname. It's Mr. Glass. Because, thank you, Adam. I have a a, a susceptibility. I'm prone to getting injured. But not just any injury. I like to tear ligament type injury. What you don't know is since I've been gone, I've already tore ligament my other ankle, hello, and had to have surgery on it. So I did that back in August. So he said this thing about ligaments, and I got so, it like blew up in my mind when I saw a ligament. I said, oh man, I know a lot about ligaments. There's over 900 ligaments in the human body. (laughs) Ligament is something that connects bone to bone. So we have three types of real tissue in the body. You have muscles, tendons, and ligaments. Muscles do the heavy lifting. They do the constricting. They're the thing that gets the bone to move. Tendons, they're the thing that connects muscle to bone. If your tendon is snapped and you try to lift your biceps, you you can't lift your arm. It's not connected anymore. And then there's ligaments. And these five-fold offices, these five giftings are the ligaments to the body of Christ. They are the thing that connects bone to bone, joint to joint. Two things that were separated now become connected through your gifting, through your equipment, through the maturity that God is doing in your life. He brings things together. So your gifting is a catalyst for connection. It brings the body of Christ together. It brings other people along the journey. When you're operating in your grace, the body of Christ becomes assembled. Ezekiel, when he's crying out to the dry bones and he's prophesying over them, it says that they connected bone to bone. The ligaments came together before the tissue and the sinew and the tendons and the muscles came. And so we, I believe this church, has been called and gifted to be the ligaments in the body of Christ, to operate in these five offices. 
And some of you have been serving. Like I said, these five ministries equip those who are doing the work. Some of you have been in that middle part and God wants to bring you to this. God wants to take you deeper in your calling, in your anointing, in the authority that he has given you. And I, broken, imperfect, messed up, flawed, and made just an example of what this house can do, of what the people in this room, God's called you here for a reason. That means he's given you the right person. They might be in the row next to you. They might be in the row behind you. But he's making you a catalyst for others. He wants to equip you with the grace to be someone that builds bridges, that brings two things together so that the whole can be edified. There was nothing special about my development besides I was just open to it. I have an intimate relationship with a a square tile of carpet over here. Because I can't tell you how many times I've spent bent over crying and weeping, learning to mature, learning to go through hard lessons, dealing with mistakes I've made, dealing with correction, dealing with things that I thought were unjust, dealing with all the different things that were going on in my life. I got real acquainted with that square over there. But what the Lord was doing through that entire process is he was just equipping me. He was just equipping me. He was just building in me maturity. He was just bringing me along the journey of learning and living before I would dare try to give it out. And I just would submit to each and every one of you, God has that same thing for you. There are those in this church that operate in all five of those offices. All five of them. I believe it, I've seen it, and I'm a product of it. And so the real question is, what do you want to do about it? Because see, what stops people from serving, sometimes what hinders you from growing in God is that you view yourself as you presently are today, and so you disqualify yourself. Rather than seeing what God can cultivate in your life. Man, if you would have known me back then, you'd be like, oh, no, he probably ain't going to make it. God can take you where he needs to take you. We don't need to have all the tools. He'll give them to us. We don't need to have all the answers. He'll supply them. We don't need to have all the resources because he has everything that we need. I want you to start seeing yourself as a catalyst. Connecting people to God and connecting people to each other. What would change in your family if you just did that? Come on, your household would look different if you were the catalyst. Well, but they do, it doesn't matter. You're the catalyst. Well, if you only knew what they said or how they act, it's okay. God's just maturing you to be the catalyst. He's maturing you in these gifts. So whether he's called you to be a teacher, he's given you the gift to raise up evangelists, to disciple and pour into those in the prophetic office or an apostolic office, God wants to use you. Everyone in this house is an equipper. You might be in this season of being equipped, but God is calling you to equip others. What would happen? I mean, just if each and every one of us in this room were intentional about equipping one person, they, I mean, they would have to go to, you guys would have to go to four services. There wouldn't be enough room in this house because everyone was so on mission. Everyone was so aligned and saying, God, I want to glorify you through my life. Not with my talent, with my heart, with my love for people. I want you to be pleased with it. And we need more people. You know, I was told a a scary stat the other day that the average age of a senior pastor in America is 61. Ain't nothing wrong with being 61. But if that is the average age of ministers that we have, what's going to happen in 10 to 15 years? So don't think, well, somebody already does that gift. Somebody already does that job. Someone's already equipped to do that. No, no, no. We need everybody. You cannot run out. uh, You cannot get too many equipped saints to do the work of God. It's impossible. There's always brokenness. There's always need. So don't find a reason to discount yourself. Don't find a way to say, ah, somebody's already doing it. I don't, you know, they already got a community's lead. I guess I don't need. No. Submit yourself to the process. 
God wants to equip you. I wanna pray for something specific. If you would all stand to your feet with me. I wanna share one last story with you about how when we just say yes to God, he ex- far exceeds our expectations or imagination. I grew up, my, my sisters at least, I grew up as the, the man in the house with my, my two older sisters and one of my roles, I always thought, this is before I was even saved, was I'm gonna walk my sister down the aisle. Man, I was so excited, I was like, I'm gonna step in, I'm gonna be the man, I'm gonna take my sister down the aisle. This is before I said yes to God. And in between the time she got married, I had given my, my heart over to Christ. I had submitted myself to being equipped. I would gone through the process. And can I be honest with you, on her wedding day, I didn't get to walk her down the aisle. I didn't. No, but because I said yes to God, I was in a different position. Instead of walking her down the aisle, I was watching her be walked down the aisle. As I stood at the altar as the pastor who was going to officiate her wedding. And there was just this an exchange. I couldn't even talk. Everyone was just crying. My sister was crying. I was crying. And God just reminded me, you thought, you thought this is the limit of what you can do. But because you said yes to me, I gave you something that you never thought imaginable. I gave you something that far exceeded the joy that you thought you can have. Can I tell you, there's joy in the equipping process. Maturity doesn't have to hurt for always. You can get excited about it. And matter of fact, the more mature you become, the more you get in this process, the more you embrace it because you know it's developing you for something greater. And so I want to pray specifically because I'm a product of people coming to this altar and praying for me and believing for me and speaking life to me. I only feel it right that I do the same. And so in just a moment, Pastor Brandon and the team, they're going to lead us in worship But I want you to examine your heart right now. Could God possibly be calling you for more? Could he possibly be trying to prepare you and nudge you to equip you to take you to a new lay, a new place, a new land of serving, a new opportunity of ministry? Process that in your heart. Consider that he might be calling you out deeper where you have to have more faith, where you have to have more trust. And this is what I want us to do. If you feel, look, it's okay to serve. We need people to serve, to do the work. But if you are in this process of saying, Lord, I want to be surrendered, that you might want to call me to now equip others. That's that group right there. The equippers of others. I want to ask you to come to the altar because I want to pray with you. I want to believe God that by his spirit, he's going to anoint you. He's going to set you apart. So even now, you could slip out of your seat and come down. If you say, Lord... I've been, I've been equipped to do the work, but now I think you want to equip me to do equipping for others. I used to just do the, the work. Now you're, train, you're using me to train 100 people to do it. You're equipping me for more, God. I know this is a specific ask, but I believe God is calling people. I look around this room. It does not matter your age. I believe he's calling you into ministering to other people. I believe there's young people in here. I can't believe how big JT is right now. But guess what? God might be giving him the prophetic tongue for a generation that he will have the key to be able to speak their language to help them and do a a life of purity or understanding the challenges of faith that a young person might have. So it's not about any condition we can put on it. If it's God, it's God. We don't want to fight it. We don't want to belabor it. We want to surrender to it. Thank you again for joining us. We pray that message ministered to your heart and lifted your spirit today. Hey, to find out more about joining the RLC online family, you can find us on the Church Center app. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. God bless you.